Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for tonight's discussion with uh, our esteemed colleagues who I will uh, introduce in just a moment. Tonight's webinar is about uh, the social media and gaming in the neurodiverse population. Um, and as we will discuss a number of times as we're going through some of the related uh, topics and issues tonight that while there are unique concerns that we have when it comes to the neurodiverse population, the truth is that much of what we will discuss tonight um, is relevant for, uh, for anyone with a, a beating heart. Um, there's really um, so much to, to really focus our efforts on. I know that um, if you are like me and a member of our community, and you know, you, you've probably heard many um, you know, speeches, talks, webinars about um, related topics, um, and I think you can't, uh, as speaking as, as a parent of, uh, of, of children um, of, in varying ages, I can tell you that uh, you can't hear this uh, too much um, because it helps, helps hopefully to, to um, help you think about things in a little bit of a novel way, but even if not, you know, reminders are, are always helpful. Um, I think that, um, you know, uh, Dr. Shapiro, um, who I'm going to introduce in a moment, um, pointed me right before, um, right before today's webinar to an interesting article um, that talks about an announcement that the Surgeon General made this week, um, where he said that he believes that uh, the age of 13 is too young for children to be on social media. I'll just share a quick quote. He said, I personally, based on the data I've seen, believe that 13 is too early. It's a time where it's really important for us to be thoughtful about what's going into and how they think about their own self-worth and the relationships and the skewed and often distorted environment of social media often does a disservice to many of these children. And uh, that, you know, while many of us may have known that intuitively um, before, oh, I'm sorry, this is my screen get off. And while some of us may have known that intuitively before, um, it certainly um, is nice to hear that the Surgeon General is um, recognizing that as well, and hopefully should give us some chizuk that this is something that is serious and deserves uh, and deserves our attention. Um, tonight, uh, we'll be um, I will be joined by some of my, my colleagues. Um, first up is uh, Mrs. Freda Stone, who is our director of Sinai Maor at the Ray Kushner Yeshiva High School. Um, and as we're joining her is uh, Mrs. Pesha Nu, who's our social worker at, uh, at Sinai. Um, and also joined by Dr. Ali Shapiro, who's the director of the Digital Citizen, Citizenship Project. Uh, he also has to be, happens to be a very old friend of mine. We, uh, we, we got to spend some good summer, uh, summers together in camp. Um, and it's always good to reunite on uh, important topics like this. Um, so, I, I, I want to just point one thing out, which is that as I introduced uh, Mrs. Stone and Mrs. New, I mentioned that they both work in our, one of our high schools. So um, their, their perspective, their experience is certainly um, from that lens. Um, Dr. Shapiro um, works with a very wide spectrum of students um, in age and otherwise. Um, so please know that much of what we'll be talking about, uh, while some of it will be age specific, much is, is really um, relevant to, to eight kids of, of any age. So let's just uh, start the conversation and then we'll go from there. The last thing is that we, we, we hope to have this conversation and then towards the end to have some uh, question and answers. So um, feel free to use the question and answer button on the bottom of the screen to submit questions. And uh, as time allows, we will try to get the, as many of them as, as possible. So let's kick this off. Uh, Freda, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us a little bit about your perspective on the trends that you've seen in school. You've you know, worked in a high school environment for uh, many years, and uh, you know, as technology has evolved so quickly, you've had a front row seat to seeing how, how kids interact, and so I'd love to hear your perspective on the trends that you see. Um, I think it's important to start with um, recognizing that the use of technology today in school is ubiquitous. And it is very important as an educational tool 
for students. And I would say particularly for the population that we're focusing on this evening, the neurodiverse population in terms of being a, a, a very significant tool in education for students who have special education needs. Um, it's also a very, uh, technology also offers a very, um, it's very important and is um, useful in terms of socializing kids who have particular social inhibitions in terms of face-to-face -face communication are more comfortable uh, socializing through the screen, on the screen, and that can be a, an important social outlet for them. At the same time, we also are seeing um, a very concerning trend in terms of over-dependence on gaming, on, um, on social media, on really screen time in general. And I would say that that is a particular concern, again, in our population of students. Um, and so this is something, you know, it's in terms of overuse of, of, of um, technology, too much screen time, and also in terms of use of social media, um, our population of students are um, less uh, able to filter the way that they communicate on social media, and that can certainly make them vulnerable uh, in their social media use. Uh, they're vulnerable potentially even to, to predators online, and they're vulnerable in terms of not really having the best sense of what to, how to communicate uh, on the screen, uh, how to be appropriate, what is appropriate. And I would say finally that the trend that we see that is significant in terms of school, in terms of education is um, simply lack of sleep because students um, will be up till all hours um, on their screens, you know, on social media, on the computer gaming. Uh, and that uh, is certainly, that certainly impacts uh, how they are in school the next day. So lack of sleep is a big concern and a trend that we're seeing as well. As I'm sitting here, um, listening to all the concerns you have, I'm, I'm thinking about concerns not related to technology that we would have about our kids and how we would never, you know, we would never let, uh, maybe this isn't the greatest muscle, but, you know, we would never let a 13-year-old drive a car, even though they really want to drive a car and all their friends are driving a car because, like, that's ridiculous. And as I'm, you know, listening to you talk about the impact that this is having on on our kids, um, I don't mean just our students in our school, but uh, you know, kids in general. Uh, that those are you know really really scary, um, really scary impacts. Um, Dr. Shapiro, is this something that you've uh, seen as well? And yeah, I, first of all, I, I just want to I, I love the example that you gave about driving because inherently driving is not good. It's not bad. It's really what you make of it. If you're a safe, responsible driver then it brings us tremendous conveniences and efficiencies, much in the way that technology does as well. Um, but mm -hmm. in the same way, we wouldn't just hand the keys over without educating and even beyond education. So you have to you know, take a written test and then you have to take an actual road test. But even that gets escalated in many states. You know, the standards of driving, you know, you start out, you can drive with someone else in the car and then you can drive during daylight hours and then you can drive if you're on your way to school or back. And, and so there's standards that we 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 increase um, and we indoctrinate a process by which kids end up driving on their own. Um, and as parents, you know, it's interesting that you give that as an example also. When parents are struggling, do I get my child a device? They act impulsive sometimes, they're aggressive sometimes. And I, I tell them, you know, you're worried about a device in, in a year, they're going to be asking you for a driver's license. And with those same characteristics, I would also be very concerned about that as well. And so there's some great points that, that have been brought up already and, and great examples. I want to add to that, that we see gender differences as well. Uh, we have age differences and gender differences. And the gender differences actually make a big difference on their impact. Boys tend to use technology for entertainment purposes, and girls tend to use technology for relationship and social purposes, which has a very different impact on their behaviors um, online. It's not to say that boys don't use social media, but generally when boys use social media, it's for entertainment purposes. They're sending a funny pic or a, a funny clip or something that it's just for entertainment. For girls, the impact is so much greater because their self-image and their self-worth is almost directly related to the communication and the relationships that they have. And so we, we're definitely more concerned, and we're concerned about either one, but uh, we're concerned we, we see much more impact on adolescent girls as it relates to technology use uh, than boys. And boys do spend a lot of time playing video games, 
um, and staying up all hours. You know, the point that you brought up about sleep being so impactful, we surveyed <clears throat> thousands of kids across the United States in yeshivas and day schools, and um, 70, high 70, I think 78% of them report going bed to late, uh, going uh, to bed late as a result of their technology. Um, and, and all of them have their devices within reach, within, within their bed. They will generally say it's for an alarm clock, they need it to get up. But having that device within reach uh, impacts the quality of sleep, how they fall asleep, uh, wh when they stay asleep, all of that. I'm not just saying staying up late. You know, they stay up late, one, two, three o'clock, but the quality of their sleep is impacted as well. The number one predictor, we're always very concerned about our kids doing well in school. The number one predictor of their success on any given day uh, in school, both academically and socially, is directly related to the quality of sleep they had the night before. Uh, the research has replicated this uh, time and time again. And so if there's one takeaway uh, tonight, I mean, you can hear a lot of ideas, but um, you know, in, in, in targeting one specific takeaway, making sure your kids get a good night's sleep um, is, is critical. Um, and one of the best ways of doing that is making sure they don't have a device, an internet capable device next to their bed um, when they go to sleep. Uh, so those are, uh, you know, that's an important key, understanding those gender differences, their relationships with technology, um, as well as how sleep is impacting, how technology is impacting their sleep and how sleep is impacting their uh, individual potential on any given day in school. Yeah, you know, our, our parents of children with, um, with special needs, parents of the neuro neurodiverse population, um, you know, when, when they look at their kids who um, find uh, something or a few things in their life that they're excited about that bring them uh, happiness and frankly, connection, so it's um, it's it's hard, you know, for for our parents to to almost rein that in because for our kids, when I say our kids, I mean in, in the neurodiverse population, um, it's such an important key. So Pesha, if you wouldn't mind, maybe sharing a little bit about, you know, what what you see specifically um, with 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 our students um, and and uh, and the impact. Sure. Um, yeah, there's a couple of, of reasons I would highlight as, as to why this is something that is prevalent in the neurodiverse population. Um, uh, first of all, um, and this was touched upon, um, a lot of our students struggle with social skills, social anxiety, um, and not recognizing social cues. So they tend to spend more time on devices. They, might, they tend to isolate themselves more with their devices um, in general. So this is a population who, by communicating online, whether it's in a WhatsApp group, whether it's on social media, whether it's um, on gaming sites with chatting capabilities, um, like we said, they're going to be more comfortable. They're going to be more confident. It's a way for them to be included with their peers. Um, but because of the social anxiety or social skills concerns um, that we have, they're more likely to have an unhealthy relationship with technology. Um, they may not respect other people's boundaries. They may present themselves in an inappropriate or unhealthy way because of the social skills challenges. Um, another thing that I would say is a lot of our students that we see are, are more impulsive in general and less inhibited. So that's gonna come across on social media as well and online as well. So, um, you know, they may have trouble regulating their behavior. Um, so again, whether it's chatting with games, whether it's social media, whether it's just a, a text or a WhatsApp group, um, they may not recognize what's safe and unsafe, who is safe and who is not. Um, and they just may have less maturity to deal with some of the challenges that come up on social media and technology. Um, and, and gaming in general, which just makes them more vulnerable. So I would say, you know, the combination of the social anxiety or social skills challenges with the impulsivity um, and with maybe just less maturity with, with social media um, are all, you know, concerns that make this um, more concerning for this population. I want to I want to jump on on what you're saying as far as some of those those key areas. You know, you you talked about self regulation, impulsivity, disinhibition. Um, all of these, you know, it, it certainly is impacting the neurodiverse population, but it impacts everybody. There's something about technology that even as adults, we are less self regulated, we are more impulsive, we are less inhibited. Um, I give the example often that. If I were to send you an email from Ellie at ellieshapiro.com, it's very clear. That was a plug for my website, by the way. Uh, it's very clear who it is 
I'm still more likely to do or say something than I would in a face-to-face -face conversation. So there's something inherent about technology that promotes that. Then when you're dealing with a more complicated population where there might be anxiety or social anxiety, that will predispose them towards developing a less healthy relationship with technology. And so a strategy in this area for parents is that parents need to recognize that the self-regulation piece as it's hard enough for us as adults to do it, but when we give our kids devices, there, if there's an expectation that they're going to self-regulate on their own, that's a very misguided um, expectation. And we as parents, it is incumbent upon us to set those regulations. And we can do that in real time where we can say, okay, um, you know, let's take the idea of not having a device next to bed. That is part of our role in helping our kids self-regulate. But even when it comes to gaming or when it comes to being on social media, we can do that in real time. Or we can also utilize the settings that are available on devices um, to regulate that. So um, the most popular phone used by kids today is the iPhone. The iPhone has settings on it, screen time that allows certain shutoff times, that allows maximum amount of times uh, during the day per app. So you could say, okay, I want my child to be able to connect with their friends, but an hour a day on WhatsApp, and I'm not saying an hour is the right number, each child's going to be different, but you can set the phone at an hour a day that once they hit an hour of use, it will give them a warning and say, you've you know met your time frame, et cetera. So these are things parents should keep in mind, the resources that are available to them um, in the devices themselves. Almost every device has um, the capability, even an Xbox, uh, you can set it to shut off at a certain time or maximum number of hours a day. But all these devices utilizing it, but also the job of parenting in today's digital age really is to be the regulator of technology for your children because they can't do it on their own. So I, I, th I think, um, you know, as I'm listening to you, Ellie, and thinking about all of the ways that we can help our kids regulate their use with you know the restrictions that come on the phone and other suggestions by keeping it out of the the, the bedroom at night and, and and other other types of suggestions i'm thinking that you know there's another piece of this which is okay the, the phone is a reality social media is a reality we live in a, in a world where if you're if you're listening to this webinar it's in your house you're trying to figure out how to do best by and then so there's there's the restrictions piece but then there's also how do we use this in a healthy way. And for our kids, when I was listening to Pesha before about all of the you know, struggles that uh, neurodiverse kids have specifically you know, emotionally and socially, um, I think about how we as a community, as uh, educators, mental health professionals, and parents shouldn't shy away from uh, directly and actively um, teaching these skills, you know, just like you know, if, if we, there are social skills classes that we have in our school or that, you know, you can get to do privately or other schools have. So that's and nothing to do with, or not necessarily having anything to do with technology, just learning how to, you know, carry a conversation and make eye contact and, and give the child the skills that they need to be able to succeed socially. And I, I think just like we're doing that, we should be um, actively teaching our kids what it means to interact online. I would add to that. I would like to highlight the importance, and uh, you know, this has been touched on already, but the importance of parents setting limits on their kids, not just in how they use it, teach them how to use technology, but actual limits and boundaries on the amount of screen time, on the on the, the the setting um, that they're on their screens. It's it's just it's very easy to have a to to have a kid, you know, closeted in a room and and on a device. Um, they're quiet, they seem happy, uh, and it feels like they're home and they're safe, but they're really not because they're out there on, you know, out there online. And um, I think that I would also highlight the particular challenge of setting boundaries with some of, you know, the kids, uh, the kids that we have in our school, the kids from the neurodiverse population, because they do sometimes in their profiles, they have a tendency to be more rigid. It's harder to set boundaries with them. So it's very challenging. So this is part of the bigger picture of parenting and parenting kids who can be more challenging. But I think I would like to highlight the, the importance of, of the parenting piece in terms of setting those limits. And as you said, Rabbi Rothwax, teaching our kids um, safe and safe use of use of technology. Yeah. Um, 
to what extent um, have any of you, I guess we could you know, start with Dr. Shapiro, but uh, you know, move on. Um, to, what, to what extent have you found that COVID has been a contributor to these challenges, either you know, dependence on technology, on, on phones, um, and, and to what degree maybe we, we're experiencing in school that kids' interaction on phones and even with you know, their, their peers or teachers uh, or other adults in schools have maybe been impacted by, by, by that time that, thank God, we're, we're stepping out of a little bit. So it, it's interesting, you know, a lot of positive came out. Let, let, let me go back one step. COVID wasn't ideal. I think we can all agree that it did not, you know, um, I, I did not have my copy of the Educator's Guide to Managing a Global Pandemic when whatever you do is going to be the wrong thing. Um, I misplaced that somewhere. Um, and, you know, a lot of what we were doing and shifting towards digital distance learning um, and also, in many cases, the ability to connect socially, we were isolated um, from family, from friends, we became, we became extremely dependent on technology. Um, and again, I would say it wasn't ideal. The flip side is that if we didn't have the capabilities of technology, uh, it would have been even more of a disaster. I mean, you think about what, what if we couldn't even do distance learning? Um, and what if we couldn't connect uh, digitally with family and friends? And so I think we're entering now a time of reflection uh, and looking at how did technology, uh, you know, the way in the way it exploded, how did it benefit us and how did it create challenges for us? Uh, I, I just attended a meeting earlier today uh, with a group of mental health agencies. And of course, they were all describing the explosion of of demand for services as it relates to anxiety and depression and, and isolation. And, um, but they're also talking about the benefits of tele, telehealth and, and, and therapy online being an opportunity for people who didn't have access to resources before um, all of a sudden finding themselves having access. And so one of the things that I'm always cautious about is making categorical statements about online or screen time or uh, anything like that. And I think we opened with the idea that really technology does present so many opportunities, but we want to take a more sophisticated understanding of technology. And I, I divide it into five categories that all start with C. I call it the five Cs. Um, it was actually, it wasn't so easy to come up with words of C that actually fit each category. But uh, starting with the lowest level uh, of consumption, consumption to me is Netflix binging. When you're just sitting in front of a screen, consuming the information. It's the lowest form of, uh, of a screen engagement. Um, or it's like that YouTube vortex you get into um, where you know, you're gonna start with something responsible like um, uh, bird migratory patterns. You, know, you look that up like, oh, I'm gonna educate. And then you know, it's like, if you like this video, you're gonna love uh, the history of aviation. I'm like, yeah, the history of aviation, that's important. And then you go into that. And of course, there's no history of aviation without the Hindenburg disaster. So they show that, you know, that was the, uh, the um, uh, hot air Zeppelin that blew up over, over New Jersey. And um, then obviously from that, it goes to the history of Led Zeppelin. And then like, you're like totally off course mm -hmm. Uh, with what you what you started with. And that, so that's like the consumption. It's the least healthy type. But then you have the highest level of screen engagement, uh, which is creative. And creative uh, is the distance learning. It's the uh, coding. It's the graphic design. It's, it's a process by which it's a positive process that you're utilizing a screen. So I get very nervous when I hear uh, statements, you know, just about screen time. And I think that our role, both as parents and edu educators, is to think about how we're utilizing the, the incredible benefits that screens bring to us um, and avoiding the inherent challenges. And, and conversations like this, uh, you know, foster the opportunity to have that dialogue. And now let's think about when our child is in front of a screen, you know, what are they doing? Is it a positive uh, growth oriented experience for them or is it a, you know, a time wasting uh, negative uh, experience for them? And, and as parents, we wanna, we wanna think in those terms and, and not have categorical definitions of, you know, screen time's good, screen time's bad, uh, just to take an approach where we're, again, managing that regulation. Um, what's interesting is um, it's, it, we surveyed, as I said, thousands of kids the kids reported that they spend 50 to 100% more time on screens for non-school related activities than school related activities. So the, the, at least 50 to 100% more time 
So it's not the history homework that they're spending at three in the morning uh, on, on their computers and on their devices. And so as parents, we want to think, and when it comes to helping our kids regulate, we want to regulate it in a way where they, where again, it's more sophisticated. It's not just get off the computer or just get off your phone. It's let's understand what the behaviors are, what the activities are, and is this a positive for them? Is it in, in enhancing their life or is it a negative and an intrusion in their lives? Um, you, you mentioned before, uh, Ali, about um, different devices and different types of uh, controls that one might have. And when we think about different devices, or when I do, I think, you know, galaxies or iPhones, um, but the truth is that the, the different types of technologies that are at our kids' fingertips, um, and that could be equally as uh, productive or destructive, um, is actually, you know, much, much more best. So it's hoping that you might, um, open our eyes a little bit on some of the things that parents should be thinking about, not just their phone, which is most obvious, but perhaps other, other types of technology as well. So, uh, you know, anything that, um, that serves as, as a distraction can be problematic. You know, the phones, uh, I would just, let me start with the phones just briefly that, and, and, and just iPhone as example, one of the challenges when getting into the specifics about devices is there are so many devices, each which is with its own piece, but, um, when it comes to uh, phones, you should be setting it up so that the access that your child has um, is what you want them to have, which means locking up the app store because they can download apps. If you do a search, um, how to hide files from my parents, right, just do that search. There'll be like these apps like uh, iCalculator. It'll look like a calculator. It'll even work like a calculator. But when you put in a certain code, the calculator will disappear and it'll give access to other files. I mean, these are things, these kids are, are, are uh, creative. Um, but if you limit the app store, they can't download that app. So that's why, you know, parents say, oh, well, I can see what's on their phone. You, you can't see what's on their phone because you're not looking for everything. So having the app store set up, having set times, the same thing applies, by the way, to an Xbox, um, you know, gaming a lot of parents don't realize that an Xbox is basically a computer that also plays video games. Um, it's online, it's connecting with other people, there are apps you can download, there's a web browser, um, they, they can download uh, in the same way if you have a smart TV, uh, in an Xbox you can download the apps that give you full access to these things. Um, so it's important, whatever electronic device that connects or even doesn't connect to the internet, in, in certain communities, um, people are using SD cards in a flip phone to have access to television shows and, and images. Um, and so I, I know everything I'm saying sounds so exhausting. It absolutely is. Um, but the more control you have over it, the more you understand the devices, uh, the, the better you'll be able to manage it as a parent. There are three things that I think every parent needs to know when it comes to giving your children access to devices, and not only their devices, but your devices as well. Um, one is the device itself. You really have to know how to utilize devices. So whether it's an Xbox or whether it's a Amazon Kindle or whether it's an iPhone, you really know, need to know the ins and outs of it and how to set it up correctly the first time. Um, go on YouTube. Uh, you can learn how to uh, set these devices up. Some devices are easier than other devices, but you have to know the devices. You have to know what you're giving your kids access to. So even something that sounds innocuous, a social media that everyone has. You hear that all your child's friends have Instagram. Do you know what is available on Instagram? Uh, you know, check it out. Um, there are a couple of websites that I recommend to do research. So I, I do my own research. I'm going to give away some of my trade secrets here. Um, so um, there's a guy, uh, Josh Oaks, something called Smart Social. He reviews a lot of the apps and a lot of the... Um, uh, the uh, games that become available and tells you where the concerns are. So Josh Oak Smart Social. Uh, the other uh, website is Common Sense Media. Common Sense Media is a great resource for parents to educate about what the content uh, that their children might be. Um, one of my kids wanted to, uh, to watch the show uh, Squid Games. It was very big a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, we went on um, Common Sense Media together and we reviewed it and it said, you know, a dystopian society where people are murdered and, you know, it was very, very gory and, and, and disturbing. And so he looked at me, he goes, so I'm not going to watch it, right? 
and I'm like, you're not going to watch it. So that was the process we went through. So you have to know the devices. You have to know what you're giving kids access to. And most importantly, you have to know your child. Certain kids are more sensitive to different content. Certain kids are able to regulate themselves better than other kids. Certain kids, you know, they have their phone and it's there. It's not there. They're losing it. It's not even on their radar so much. Other kids, it's like, you know, they're NRA members with with guns and, you know, you're not prying it from them. Um, so these are just things to think about when you're giving your kids devices and access. Those are three key things, being educated yourself uh, and setting up the devices for success based on your individual child. Yeah, I, I would, if I could add to that, um, because again, these are, are such valuable lessons that apply to all teenagers. Um, and specifically, again, with, with our population that we're talking about tonight, um, um, you know, we said before that our kids can sometimes be more rigid in their thinking and, and then you'll have more pushback as a parent. Um, but we've also seen with our students that they, they really thrive when they have those rules and boundaries and guidelines, even though there's the pushback, it's so important for them to be successful, to have those guidelines and rules in place. Um, and I think like we said before, in terms of like knowing your, your child, um, you know, with our students also, they even just with real life social skills and real life skills, they don't necessarily pick them up naturally or from their peers and we have to clearly teach them. Um, so the same is with these apps and, and on the phones and on devices that we have to be that much more careful and in teaching them and pointing out what's safe and what's not safe. Um, that's really important for them. Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's fascinating. This, this conversation because I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about, we're talking about kids and kids and their, their, their struggles and their you know, reliance or addiction or whatever you want to call it with, with different forms of technology. And I think Ellie pointed out earlier in our conversation, like, you know, maybe not in these words, but we have to look inside as well um, and, uh, and recognize that this is something that we all struggle with. If, if it's even a hava mina in your in your home, that there's going your child's going to have a phone. So likely that you you have a phone as well. And um, I know that when my phone is next to me, forget about it in my bedroom when I'm going to sleep, but if that's next to me at the at the kitchen table, um, it's a distraction. Just a, being there. Forget about my you know my looking at it or answering a text or or writing an email. So. I, I think that an important part of this discussion, I'd love to hear what uh, my esteemed colleagues feel, is that part of this discussion is, is a little lot of chashbon anefesh, a lot of introspection about what our relationship with, um, with technology is. And of course, then, you know, modeling what we expect from, from for, for our kids um, and being able to have like a really um, honest um, and open and developing conversation with them. You know, what Ellie spoke a minute ago about, you know, the conversation about the, that he had his, with his son about the, the movie and they went together and they researched it. You know, I wasn't there, but it sounded like it was so natural because it's just like, it's just what happens in the house and it's a conversation and onwards. Um, it doesn't have to be such a big deal, but, but, but that takes a lot, you know, from parents to, to um, identify that on their, on their own and then to be able to build uh, the expectations of the home accordingly. So, I don't know if any of you have any any thoughts on that. But I, that, to me, I think that's the the you know one of the biggest struggles here is is that you know there's a lot a lot to unpack with with what you just talked about, and I'll, I'm going to try to be brief and give everyone else a chance to talk. Um, but first of all, there's a lot of research on on if you just Google. Uh, the mere presence of a smartphone, just put in the term, the mere presence of a smartphone, uh, hundreds of studies will come up on how cognitive functioning declines just by having your phone within proximity. So study tips that we give kids all the time is don't study with your phone. Not that you're touching, it shouldn't even be on the desk, on the table. They've given kids standardized tests um, random selected kids had a phone on the desk. They weren't allowed to touch it. They weren't allowed to look at it. They consistently scored lower than kids that did not have their phones with them. And so that's something to keep in mind. The same, uh, the same research applies to adults as well. Uh, having a phone in presence serves as a distraction. We actually did some work um, with the business. We've done some research on workforce well-being and productivity in the digital age and how technology is impacting uh, work, workforces. Um, and uh, we were one of the, the one of the pieces we looked at was frequency of checking email. 
um, checking and responding to email. And we looked at two groups. This was based on a different study, but we looked at two groups of, of groups that responded to uh, emails as they came in and groups that had a designated time uh, during the day or multiple designated times during the day that they checked their emails. But we found it's pretty fascinating um, that the group that would uh, check it at designated times, not only was their anxiety that they reported their anxiety tended to be lower, uh, but their productivity was actually higher. And the reason that is there's research that indicates that it takes about 20 minutes to fully immerse yourself in a task. So you're firing on all pistons, uh, uh, what's called flow that you're maximizing it takes about 20 minutes to achieve that. But if you check your device every five minutes or 10 minutes, you're starting that over again. And so when you are in, when you check your emails or check your texts at designated time, let's just say the top of the hour, what ends up happening is you spend the first 10 minutes of the hour responding to texts and emails, and then you have a 50 minute segment of where you are completely focused on work. And it's just much more productive as well as reducing anxiety. So the reason I'm telling you both ends of this as it relates to kids and as it relates to adults goes back to what Rabbi Rothwax was saying. As adults, we need to model that behavior and understand that we can be doing a better job for ourselves when it comes to technology, our own behaviors, our own relationship with technology. Um, again, I always say we have to ask ourselves the question, is technology enhancing our lives or is it serving as an intrusion in our lives? And so, yes, we need to communicate with our kids. Yes, we want to inculcate these values and ideas um, around technology for our children. One of the best ways to do it is to model it and create an environment within our homes where that conversation can take place, where as a parent, I can say, you know what, I'm putting my phone away for the next hour so we can spend time together and modeling that behavior, making it transparent for our kids to see what we're doing with our technology so they can learn and see that this is not just about us being authoritarian style parents and 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 putting restrictions on them but this is an approach as a family that we want to take to better exist and maximize what technology has to offer by understanding the challenges that it presents i i think our, our policies in school also need to reflect some of those realities um, you know, even that, that idea that if the cell phone, if the phone is on the desk, even if it's off, if the student isn't using it, it's going to be a distraction. So that certainly impacts the policies that we set in our classroom where students have to really put away the phone uh, during class times. And they, they sometimes want to be charging it where it's in with, within reach. And this, it really is still a distraction. So these kinds of um, th that those realities impact the policies that we set in school to try to maximize student engagement and learning and focus and learning. And as opposed to using the phones, at least in our classrooms, um, we, we, we provide Chromebooks so that they're on a different device, a separate device to do their schoolwork and the phones are put away. Yeah, I, um, I, I am listening to the conversation here. I'm thinking about how members of our community um, maybe have one advantage, but we have a lot of advantage, but one specifically um, is that we have a taste of the good life. We have a taste of Me'in Olam Haba every week. We have a taste of Shabbos. And while, you know, it's not a struggle for any of us, you know, who, you know, to, to shut off the, the phone on Friday afternoon and not even have an, an impulse to, to look at it. So kind of like demonstrates, again, I, I keep going to that that introspection, like demonstrates to ourselves, like we could do this. We do this, you know, every every week. And sometimes even for two, three days straight, we do it every once in a while. And we don't even, we don't even blink an eye. So I, I think I, I'm mentioning that because I think that that should serve as a source of chizuk for us. That like we, we, we could do this. But we just have to train ourselves that these this, these these restrictions I, I do think on ourselves are these expectations can be done and it becomes comes part of the routine. I do think for kids today they have a Yetzir Hara that we did not have uh, to check devices on Travis to utilize. There was a study in 2012, and this goes back 10 years, um, where they found that 18 percent of otherwise uh, Shomer Shabbos kids were utilizing what they were calling it half Shabbos, where they would utilize devices for social media. Um, on Shabbos. And, and the, the findings were very similar that kids with social anxiety and anxiety in general had a harder time with it. And this, this is a, a Yetzirah that, you know, I think we need to understand is, is very real uh, for kids today. 
Um, you know, I uh, you had reference that we had gone to camp together, and uh, there was a, a great study by UCLA where they measured kids' abilities to read facial expressions and social cues, uh, and then they sent them to camp without any technology, and then they measured them again throughout the summer. And what they found was that after only five days without the technology, uh, their ability to read facial expressions and social cues and form meaningful connections vastly improved. Again, this was the general population, probably different with the neurodiverse population, but understanding that digital technology is having a negative impact because of that dependence that some kids are developing on it, they're not fully developing their actual social skills in real life because of the dependence that they're developing on technology. So Shabbos is a great example. That is when we connect best. Think about it. When do you connect best with your kids, with your spouse, with your friends? It's Shabbos because we don't have that distraction. Um, and certainly we want to be able to uh, create those opportunities during the week. And in my own home, we do something called going dark for dinner. And that's at dinner time where uh, we have no technology, no phones at the dinner table. Um, that's adults as well. So as far as parental modeling, we're connecting with our kids. My kids know they can't get up from the table until they tell me something about their day that I didn't know otherwise. Um, that's why so, you didn't. That's why you didn't answer my text last night at five thirty. Yes, yes, that's uh, no, but 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 don't. So some some parents get caught up when my kids come home at different dinner times. It doesn't have to be dinner. It can be just find a half hour during the night where you all shut down your devices. Um, and it's not just about that half hour. What you're really doing there is you're demonstrating for your kids there's a time for technology and there's a time to put technology away. And it's an amazing experience. Also on Shabbos, be transparent about it. Say, isn't it great that we can spend time together and we're not distracted by phones and devices? It, 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 communicate that to your kids. Show your kids that you recognize it um, and appreciate it. And that's something that they will internalize. They may not give you the satisfaction right away of, uh, of letting you know that you're making a difference, but you are making a difference. You're making it clear to them. You're inculcating the values. You're sharing your expectations with them and you're making it transparent. And that's really the key to, to uh, demonstrating and sharing with them uh, the expectations around technology and the benefits of taking breaks from it. I, it, to me, the um, you know there are so many takeaways from tonight's conversations in terms of specific strategies with with uh, with phones, um, with uh, going going dark for dinner. Uh, but to, it, to to me, this is really um, a lot about just good parenting. Um, we, we we may have been able to um, re, re uh, label tonight's conversation to you know parenting in a digital age because um, that's that's really. That's really, really what this is about. And, you know, people have different parenting styles um, and forget about technology just in terms of the, you know, permissiveness or lack thereof in their, in their home or how strict they are about different things. And I, I, we all have to find a balance in what works for ourselves and our families. And I know that there's a lot of research on parenting styles, but ultimately this whole conversation comes down to um, us as parents and, and educators um, you know, th those who are structuring the, the days and nights for our kids to be able to uh, develop relationships with our kids where they'll be able to, um, you know, not only listen and only adhere to the rules, but uh, recognize its value at the same time. Um, okay. Uh, are, are there any other uh, closing remarks as we get uh, we get close to um, to the end of our time? Any, any other well, that's okay. Um, it seems at this, um, oh, it seems there's a question coming up. Give me one second. Um, question is, how do I manage a child who's already addicted? Uh, how do I take the devices away? So we're not, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to the mental health professionals here. Um, I just realized that I'm the only one who doesn't have a mental health degree here. Okay, um, I will uh, leave that to the mental health professionals. But how, there's a, a parent wondering how how do you manage a child who's already addicted? Well, I I mean any anyone else you know can jump in. Also, I don't know that um, you have to jump to taking the device away. You know, a hundred percent. I think that there's there's room to um, come up with, I don't want to say compromise, but come up with guidelines of you could be on the device under these guidelines. Um, 
as opposed to you cannot have it. Um, and, you know, coming up with a system that would work specifically for that child as opposed to taking it away. You know, maybe there could be a situation where it would come to that. But um, I think um, in general, because like we said, our kids, they, they have them in school, they need them, um, you know, coming up with, with guidelines that work for that child, you know? Um, so yeah, you know, one of the things, uh, sometimes parents, um, sometimes parents feel that their children uh, are addicted to phones. Um, a lot of times it's a generational difference. It's, it's important to understand that kids are utilizing technology in different ways than we adults do. So the first thing I would really want to know um, is, uh, is, you know, the way we define, you know, addiction as a term is, is it interfering with their primary role obligation? And so I want to think in terms of, uh, you know, is the student, uh, is your child uh, doing okay in school? Do they do homework? Do they have friends? Do they hang out? Do they do non-digital things? Or is it exclusively digital to the uh, detriment of their academic performance, their, you know, their, their social interactions, et cetera? Um, I would be concerned that if it's gotten to that point, it's not necessarily about the technology per se, um, that the technology is just the way in which the uh, self-destructive behaviors are manifesting in themselves. And it may not just be about technology. It may be a larger... Um, a larger concern that needs to be addressed. Um, but if we're talking about, um, let's just say the, the, the general type of quote unquote dependent behavior that we see kids engaging in, um, it's, it's, you know, and, and the point that Pesha made is, is, is so important. Um, you know, I, I never like when people use, compare technology to drug addiction um, because one can live without drugs, one, cannot live without technology. It's, it, you know, at some point they're going to utilize it. So I like to look at it more like a, like a food addiction, uh, where it's figuring out the balance of how you can utilize, you know, a healthy degree of engagement. It goes back to parental regulation. And what, one of the hard things to do is to retrofit. If you've set up bad habits within your house, telling your child, okay, I just, I just attended this webinar and everything's changing out. Don't do that. No one should do that. Don't go home and turn your house upside down because of uh, the webinar. But when you need to retrofit, it needs to be done as a unit, not just about an individual child. So when you approach uh, the child that is demonstrating unhealthy behavior with technology, you know, you're approaching it as a family. Here are some things we, we are going to do as a family. We're going to engage in you know, in a family game activity. Uh, my, my family just got into Rummy Cub uh, and that's become like all the rage. Everybody's playing Rummy Cub. So uh, finding non-digital activities, shutting, reducing your uh, digital engagement as a model for the child. So this is not just about them. This is about a family activity. And one of the things that I can't stress enough is supporting any interest they have that is not digital. Uh, and that means your emotional support, your financial support. Um, I recently paid an obscene amount of money for a hockey stick for my son because he's really into hockey and he spends a lot of time playing it. And I knew he would spend more time playing it if he had a better stick. Um, and so we need to find non-digital activities that we can support our kids with and encourage them to be involved with. So I think there are a few steps with that. Really assess um, what their overall functioning is. Uh, for the old school mental health professionals, you'll remember that the SM4 had something called a global assessment of functioning, where we would look at a person's whole picture. Uh, and it's important to look at that whole picture holistically, how are they doing? Uh, and then based on that, making some decisions about what we can do to support them, to help them regulate, as well as, as a family unit, as opposed to individually, uh, you know, in, 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 you know, enforcing new guidelines that they may be um, not so uh, excited about. The idea of, of, of providing replacement activities is key. I think that's what you were touching on also, Ellie. Um, so that if we are limiting the time on the screen, that we just be mindful of replacing it with another enjoyable activity, something of interest to that particular child. Yeah, and a related, um question to some of the answers that you've been talking about is an uh, interesting question. Um, one of our participants wrote, it's my understanding that many neurodiverse kids are using gaming to self-regulate. This goes beyond entertainment. 
Do you have suggestions for helping them find other ways to self-regulate? And this participant also added, thank you, this was excellent. So thanks for the compliment. Um, but what is the whole think here? Other suggestions for helping people, our, our kids, specifically, you know, those with an in the neurodiverse population um, to self-regulate. I feel like I'm doing all the talking, but uh, I'll just throw this out. Um, so I, intuitively, whoever asked the question is, is absolutely correct. Um, there are benefits to gaming beyond entertainment. Um, in fact, there's a lot of research comparing television watching to video game play. And what they find is that in video games, there's a whole host of benefits that we see from kids who play video games compared to kids that don't play video games. Um, that includes problem solving, when you, if you have a gamer, if your child's a gamer, there is no problem that they don't think can be solved. It's, they've been conditioned to solve problems. That's what video games are. So you have uh, problem solving, collaborative problem solving, um, multitasking, drowning out external noise, um, visual motor integration, visual spatial pieces that, that are enhanced from gaming compared to consumption um that we see on on television watching so there definitely are advantages to gaming and in in uh, that emotional regulation um the question is how much is too much uh and 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 when we don't know uh that's that's part of the problem do you get those benefits from gaming after 15 minutes of gaming um the general rule of thumb that i use uh is if your child is 35 living in your basement and playing Fortnite all day you're probably past the point of benefit I would venture to say. Um, but uh, the reality is there is some benefit to gaming. And as a parent, that goes back to you are regulating it. Aside from all the classic um, techniques of mindfulness and breathing and, and uh, exercise and other things that also help you um, decompress and self-regulate, and uh, those are other techniques as well. Gaming, again, assuming the content is not problematic. We're not talking about games like Call of Duty or Grand Theft Auto or you know, any of these graphically disturbing uh, games, but, you know, games in general, there are benefits to it. And as a parent, you want to keep, you want to monitor it, assess, and make sure that they're getting whatever benefit they are from playing video games, but also uh, limiting it in an appropriate way and finding those uh, non-digital replacement activities. Amazing. Right. I would, I would add to that, you know, like we said before, like the lowest level of consumption, even watching a show or being on Netflix. So that, that is, could be a coping skill. It is a way to relax. It is a way to unwind as adults. We do that also, but if they're doing it all night long and falling asleep in school, then it's no longer self-regulating and then it's crossing over to a different issue. So, you know, I guess, like you said, finding a balance um, and seeing how it's affecting them in other areas also um, is, is important. And, all, and of course, there are other ways that people self-regulate, including exercise, including getting enough sleep so that you're, you've got the opposite extreme. You know, if you have too much screen time, then you're, you're working against the self-regulation by losing sleep. But those kinds of things that it's not just for the neurodiverse population, but for all of us, those kinds of things that um, help us to de-stress, whether again, it's exercise, whether it's breathing exercises, whether it's um, healthy eating, whether it's getting enough sleep, all of those kinds of things are important for self-regulation. And I want to point out that excessive exercise is also problematic and excessive uh, meditation is also problematic. You know, so we, we want to look at things in a holistic way and make sure that no one behavior is, is, uh, is uh, in excess. Um, and, and it's okay if your child you know, plays a video game, don't, don't get worried. Uh, there are some benefits to it. Um, okay, we're going to take one last question here, which is, do you think giving technology as a form of positive reinforcement is productive or will it cause addiction? So again, I, you know, we spoke about the word addiction here, and I, I think it's meant here not as a clinical term, but it, is, it, is, it, is it a good idea? I'll, re, I'll rephrase it. Is it a good idea to use technology as a reward for, for children? Or because we're talking about all of the concerns that we have here, uh, maybe we should be finding something else. So, Peter, did you want to say something? I think it's the question of moderation. I think that, you know, if it's something, if it, it is 
something that that provides positive reinforcement. Uh, so then in moderation, it's a it, it's it's um, it's a reward to use. If it becomes excessive, then it becomes problematic. You know, it's 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 all a question of exactly as 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 Ellie was talking about. It's a talk. It's about balance, and it's about um, and and this and the individual child. You know, and 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 what is right for each child. Agreed. Um, okay, so thank you all for this uh, wonderful evening together. Um, I, I recognize that this is a conversation that we could probably um, be having all night because um, there's really a lot to talk about. And so uh, we, we, we touched on some important topics, uh, but to the degree that any of our participants have questions, want to get in touch with any one of us, um, feel free. I guess the best way to do that instead of giving everybody our um, contact information right now, where it might just could be a little too uh, messy, um, is to contact us through uh, the Sinai School's website, which is the contact us form. Um, feel free to um, ask us any questions there, and uh, one of us will will certainly get back to you. And um, this is the third of a of four part webinar series um, that Sinai Schools is presenting this year. The fourth is. Uh, yet to come in a few months, so stay tuned. Um, to uh, Pesha, to Freda, to Ellie, thank you so much for uh, for your collaboration on this really um, meaningful conversation, and for your friendship, and for your you know trying to make this world a, a better place um, for all of our kids. Thank you all, and have a great night.